Hey, everybody, it's Mark. I'm back with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before I get to my guest today, I just want to remind everybody about my podcast where they can find them. And that would be at www.markpattisonnfl.com. I've now done over 175 of these things, and they continue to inspire so many people, including myself, with these amazing stories, doing just incredible things. So check that out. And while you're there, please go in and give a ratings and review. There's a little iTunes uh, button you can push, and it really helps in terms of the popularity of the show. And then, you know, ultimately with the goal of trying to inspire others out there to do good in their life. While you're on that URL, www.markpattisonnfl.com, you can also see a blog about my Everest exploits, uh, plan to leave 2021 in March at the end and attack that big beast, not just Mount Everest, but also the Lhotse, they call it, well, Lhotse, which is uh, the fourth highest mountain in the world, all within 24 hours. And it will be absolutely epic. And you can find me through a Garmin app that will trace me up and down the mountain. And finally, I mentioned this uh, every week that uh, we have... uh, my, my daughter, Amelia, has epilepsy, and so we partner with a foundation here in Sun Valley, Idaho, in New York, and L.A. called Higher Ground. And with the Higher Ground Foundation, we're trying to bring money and awareness to that cause. It's called Amelia's Everest, the Load Sea Challenge. So we're already a couple thousand dollars of money raised into that, and you know, hopefully we can get the rest done, which is roughly $27,940, which represents the height of Load Sea which sits right next to Mount Everest. So on that note, let's jump into my amazing guest today. His name is Benji Alexander, and he's got quite the tale. Benji, how you doing? I am fantastic, Mark. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, you've come to me kind of a roundabout sort of ways from some various characters that I know, and um, I'm glad to have you. And, and what really stands out to me is, and I think there was a movie about the Jamaican bobsled team a bunch of years ago that I happened to watch. And when I heard this story, it obviously it reminded me a lot about, and am I going to like give the punchline away right now? And then let's just go back and kind of reset your life just a little bit, because it's interesting. You are uh, on track right now to become the first Alpine skier to represent Jamaica, which you currently sit in today as we speak in the 2022 Olympics, right? Correct, yes. And what makes this amazing is last time I checked, there's no mountains with snow on them in Jamaica. <laughs> That's uh, not- there is no snow in Jamaica. We do have the Blue Mountain, which is famous for the, the Blue Mountain coffee, but that only goes up to 7,300 feet. So it's not that tall and it never sees snow, no. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine that. And the other thing that's really great about this story is that you really didn't start skiing until uh, 2016. So you've exactly. only been at this for a certain period of time, but you've been at it and with hardcore. So let's go back to, you know, and, and, and what you are doing before, like it, it's such a disconnect to what we're going to get into you know, hear about the vision of trying to do something, setting a big goal. You know, that's something that you and I share in common. You haven't done it yet, but you train like an animal and you're trying to get there. But for many, 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 many years, you have really, you know, over 10 years, you've been this international DJ, you know, tell me about that. I mean, I, I, I talked to another guy, Ronnie Cycli, uh, the NBA yeah. player you probably know. And, yeah. you know, we went this, this whole thing, you know, famous NBA basketball player, but, you know, he is really into creating these, these sounds around the world, going back to his home country of Beirut and mm-hmm. talking about this stuff. So tell me about how does somebody even get into becoming a DJ, especially when you're talking about on a worldwide stage? <laughs> Yeah, so I actually started DJing 20 years ago. I started DJing professionally as my main source of income 10 years ago, but 20 years ago was when I first bought my turntables. Uh, and back then, that was before YouTube. It was around about the time when kind of like Napster was big and all of that stuff. Uh, and I'd come across this genre of music, this underground form of electronic dance music, and not EDM, but dance music that is electronic, that was really only available in nightclubs, at raves, or on illegal pirate radio stations in London. 
at the time I was 17 years old, 16, 17 years old. I grew up an hour outside of London, but my family would often go down to London. So when we would go down there, we'd get the opportunity to hear these radio stations. And because I wasn't of legal age, so I couldn't get into the nightclubs or to the raves, the only way for me to really recreate that experience was to buy turntables and just go out there and buy the records myself and recreate it in my bedroom. And this week actually is the 20 year anniversary of one of the first mixtapes that I put out and just kind of went viral before we even used viral to, to describe how things would propagate through our social friend group, because this was obviously before social networks. And so this weekend is the 20 year anniversary of the first mixtape that I put together. So I just started as a hobby. My interest in it kind of came and went at the time I was studying physics at the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine in London, which is basically like the MIT of England. And it wasn't until I moved to Asia, and I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, that I you know, began to hang, hang around with DJs again and started to collect the music that was super popular that moment, which was more like electro and house music. I was living in Bangkok at the time. And in 20, 2009, when I shifted and moved to Hong Kong, I just kind of like the confluence of the right things had happened. I was around people that were throwing parties. They had the right equipment. There, weren't, there wasn't much competition with regards to other people that had the ability to DJ. And I just like, I really enjoyed performing for people. And I just, something that just turned into something that I would do casually at after parties then turned into uh, a, a bit more of a serious hobby. I was invited to play at the best nightclub in Hong Kong, a club called Volar, which is still going. I think it's reopened now because Hong Kong's doing a little bit better than the rest of the world with COVID. And it, it got to the point in early 2010 where I was working 50 hours a week in the uh, industry of finance and wealth management and working five or six hours a week for, you know, across two or three gigs in Hong Kong and Macau and making enough money from the DJing alone to scrape by, but having far more fun with the DJing than obviously the suit and tie nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven, whatever you yeah. want to call it. I decided to take the leap of faith into just going full time with the creative pursuit. And, you know, I, I wanted to see what would happen. I, I, I met the person that introduced us, that would be Rob, the following year was, my eyes were open to this event called Burning Man, which I'm sure a lot of the listeners have heard of. And from then it just kind of like, everything exploded. And before I knew it, I was kind of playing all over the world. I was living in Ibiza for my summers. And by the time I'd retired from DJing, so I'm no longer doing it, at the end of 2018, I'd had the opportunity to perform in almost 35 countries. So. Yeah, it, it kind of humble beginnings and and got some real great stories out of it. That is incredible. And, you know, like, where do you think, though, that that creative bug found you uh, or you found it, you know, way back? So so I, I, I totally get that you're I mean, I've, I've talked to this. Usually it more happens to do with lawyers, like creative lawyers that really wish they were somebody right. else besides, you know, grinding away on people all day. Yep, yep. Um, not so much the finance, but in the, your, your world, the finance world, you know, was there something in your childhood or something that you always wanted to perform or be in front of people or you got gratification or were you the class clown or like, what was that versus just one day you happen to do it and mix some records and, you know, poof, you're this guy that becomes this international guy. Right. Definitely was the class clown. Definitely the troublemaker. Um, it's interesting because I never thought of being a performer of any sorts. When I when I started to collect records, you know, you and I are both old enough to still call them records yeah. um, and not vinyl, as the younger generation calls them. I, I really did it out of necessity. As I said, the energy that I was listening to on these cassette tapes that were being recorded from pirate radio was like nothing else I'd experienced. And because this music wasn't readily available on the internet, because the platforms that we rely on today, such as YouTube and SoundCloud and Spotify, because they didn't exist, out of necessity, the only way that I could get access to this thing that had this allure, this energy that I hadn't experienced anywhere else was really just to recreate it myself. You know, I'm, I'm kind of analytical, logical. Uh, I'm an engineer by, by training. I graduated from electrical and electronic engineering. I didn't finish the physics degree. And I just kind of approach these types of problems with brute force. I throw time and I throw logical ways of trying to like get better at things and, and then after a while it just you know you, you find yourself in a place where without even realizing it you've just been putting in a lot of hard work and determination but without even realizing it you're better than like you know 90 percent 95 percent 96 percent of everyone else that's doing it you you weren't doing it with the anticipation or the expectation or the desire to be on stage you were doing it because you just love the trade 
And all of a sudden you were just so much better than everyone else that you naturally just have to follow this through and then take it to the next level of going out there and performing and sharing that skill with other people. When that starts, you know, in, in a bedroom, as I said, the mixtape, there was 12 of us in the room to going to small clubs with a hundred to 200 to, to getting the opportunity to do it in front of three, four, 5,000 people. Well, the, the story I love about, about all this, you know, that we're talking about today is really you following your heart, you following your passion, following your why, following your yeah. purpose, right? That, that has literally, not only were you able to monetize your life, A, but also you were able to see, I mean, just in the short two minutes of you giving me the recap, we went through about 30 countries, right? <laughs> uh, Hong Kong and Bangkok, yeah. and you're sitting in Jamaica today and the States and all these other places. They're wonderful places. And there's nothing better than the, 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 the life of learning when you're on the road. I mean, it can Absolutely. be tiresome too, as you know, but but what a great, you know, the right space, the right time in your life to be out, you know, doing all those those incredible things. I've had a lot of friends. Uh, I've personally never been to Burning Man, but I've had a lot of friends go to Burning Man and all the pictures that come out. It just looks like you guys have been, you know, like transported to Venus or Mars another, or something. Another world. Yeah. Another world. Yeah. And and I know that there's been a lot of relationships and I'm, I, you know, those could be probably defined in many different ways, but I'm thinking more like in the business side uh, of just people going out there and getting quiet and getting peaceful and getting real and, yep. you know, some cool things coming out of those, you know, those festivals. Yeah. Well, I mean, I actually met our other mutual friend, James at Burning Man in 20, 2011 or 2012. So, th I mean, that relationship was also born out of Burning Man. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And you mentioned Rob Scott earlier. What a great guy. Yep. So, so now let's go on to kind of phase two of, of, of this life. So again, going back to James Heckman, he's got a place at Whistler and he had a, a, um, a get together of 20 or so yep. of your friends to, to come up to, he has, he has a wonderful house. Um, he actually just sold the one that you're probably getting, but another one. And, right. um, and, uh, so you guys are having this ski weekend, but the only problem is you'd never skied before. Yeah. So let's rewind two months prior to that. So at the end of 2015, I was invited to a heli ski trip. And as you've just said, the first time I skied was at that trip in 2016. So if we're now talking 2015, I've never skied before. Yeah. So my buddy, Tom, who is the main reason that I ski invites me to this heli ski lodge in Canada for Christmas. And I'm like, Tom, why would I come to a heli ski lodge? I, I don't have the ability to ski. That is not my type of thing to come and not be able to experience yeah. the full experience. And Tom was like, look, you know, there's going to be about eight of you that are keeping the, you know, the, making sure the beer is cold, making sure the jacuzzi is warm and just enjoying the food. And unlike most heli ski operations, this is five star lavish and you know, four seasons yeah. type thing. Just come and enjoy it. And without embellishing the, you know, the lavishness and how amazing this, this thing was, on one of the days, the house cats, as I'm going to call us, the eight of us that were not skiing, had the opportunity to jump into a helicopter and join the skiers on top of a hill for lunch. And I got up there and was just blown away by the scenery, by the beauty, by the remoteness of being the only people for you know, tens of miles, if not further. And then at the end of lunch, just watching all of my skiing friends hop on their skis and just you know, disappear down the side of the mountain. It just yeah. blew my mind. And from that moment there and then, I set the intention that I would not return to that place without being part of the skiing contingent. Now, two months later, I'm DJing in South America. I was in Rio, uh, and James had you know, organized this party. I, I, I DJed in Whistler. And in the midst of all the DJing, I got the opportunity to say, okay, now it's time to actually try and do this ski thing. So I, I took a lesson. I, you know, I fell 20, 30 times on my first time down this, this, this green slope. But as I said, with the DJing and, and, and with like the logical brute force kind of mentality of approaching problems, the fall, like falling 30 times on the green slope was, that, that's great. That's my bar. That's my baseline. Get out there and see if you can fall less than 30 times, which I did. And I spent the whole day falling, but with the intention of getting down that hill with less falls than the time before. Yep. Anyway, so I had two lessons, you know, I, I wasn't in, it wasn't a natural, but was better than, than most 32 year olds are if they start so, so late in life. Didn't get the opportunity to ski again for another year, but fast forward without getting kind of stuck into the details, my ninth day of skiing ever was back in Canada at that heli ski lodge. Wow. I think you'll be hard pressed to find someone that got the opportunity to go heli skiing on their ninth day. And I, the reason I bring that up is it just tries to show my mentality, like, have, like having the 
nothing can stop me. I'm going to try it, even if it sounds completely outlandish or impossible to most kind of logical thinkers. And really, that's gotten us to where we are today. As I, I speak to you today, you know, it's the end of 2020. In the season that just came to an end, I skied 183 days. Most of those days were in the backcountry after the chairlifts had stopped spinning because of the COVID. Obviously, Corona shut the whole world down. And there's just been this continued um, mentality of people saying, that's not possible. You can't do that. And me just saying, great, that adds fuel to the fire of I'm going to show you what I can do. Uh, and, and now, like, just about to get ready to go back to Jackson Hole, which is where I've been training, not too far from you. Yeah. Uh, and I hope we get the opportunity to kind of ski together or do something together. I'll be in Sun Valley for a couple of races. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be qualified for the Olympics by April, May of next year. Well, let me let me unpack that just a little bit. So I've been skiing for a long time, <laughs> and I do know what I'm doing. And I, I can I, I do know this, that when you're doing, you're talking backcountry, you're talking trees, you're talking deep snow, you're talking yeah. these helicopter type trips. You got to know what you're doing, and it's sure. not a laughing matter, and it's not trivial. People can die; they can get hurt. Yep. You know, some bad things can happen if you're not truly prepared to really understand. And and the only way you get experience is by experience, right? By doing so, it, yeah. By doing it, and sometimes you know, like you need to have a rainy day when it's snow in the in the mountains. Yeah. You need to have a cold day. You need to have a blizzard day. You need to have icy conditions. You need to go through all the conditions, and that. That just takes normally, you know, most people years to do. So my hat's off to you for taking on, you know, something that at some level must have terrified you. It's, you know, at some point in time of pointing those skis down the hill and, you know, hear yeah. all the guys go in front of you and now you got to go. But congratulations yeah. um, to that. So let's now jump to the Olympics. So, you know, obviously we know that, that, that the way I'm planning my Everest right now, I train every day twice after this podcast, I'm going to run up the mountain again. Um, nice. And, and, you know, who knows if we have a vaccine, who knows, all we can do is live in the moment, right? And you're Absolutely, probably yeah. perfected this. So right now your goal is there is the Olympics in 2022 we're in yep. the we're now we're talking on October 28th, 2020. Yep. So there's a little bit of time to get there and hopefully that the world will kind of rewrite itself here. But in terms of this goal, right? Where did the light go off? So, you know, you're doing a couple of skis and now you went from falling down 30 times, you know, in 2016, and now you go up to Revelstoke or wherever you were at, and you're doing a yep. heli thing and after nine times. So there's all this stuff going on. But at some point in time, you're going, you know what? I'm gonna make the connection because the the one the one connector point that we haven't brought out yet, uh, which I which I want to bring right now is that you have a Jamaican uh, citizenship because your father was born there, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm half English, half Jamaican. Uh, my father was born on the south side of the island, and how you know that's actually why this whole thing came about. The funny thing is, as a mixed race person, half white, half black, when you are in a group of white people, you're the black guy. And when you're in a group of black people, you're the white guy, right? So whatever the, whatever the stereotypes are for being the white person or the black person, you get to play both of those roles depending on what the kind of consensus of the group around you is. So skiing is obviously a very, very white pursuit, shall we say, or predominantly. Yeah. Um, and so that means I'm the token black guy in any group of friends when we're skiing. And not only am I the token black guy, but I'm also Jamaican. So then there's also, as, as we started this podcast by saying, there's the huge kind of you know, the movie, John Candy movie, Cool Runnings from 1993 about the Jamaican bobsled team in 1988. Everyone knows about this movie. The story itself deserves the movie and the Disney story, the Disney movie is awesome as well. So there's always, you know, people always talking about Cool Runnings and, you know, the Jamaican on ice. So honestly, this whole thing just really started off as a joke. I spent a lot of time skiing with predominantly white groups and Cool Runnings would be mentioned and, you know, Jamaican on ice, et cetera, et cetera. In 2018, I went to the Olympics in South Korea as an attendee. And I noticed that there were only three Jamaicans representing the entire country. And I was kind of taken by surprise by that fact. I would have assumed that the movie um, would have had such an impact on Jamaica uh, here, the Jamaicans here and the diaspora, because there are 2.7 million people in Jamaica, but more than 2 million Jamaicans in the diaspora across the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States alone. And I was just shocked that it didn't have more of an impact to inspire more Jamaicans to take on winter sports. Ironically, uh, we went to go and watch the two men bobsleigh 
when we drove back to our house that we were staying at in South Korea, we put the Cool Runnings movie on, which was probably the 10th time that I'd seen this movie, and the light bulb kind of went off. If there's only three athletes representing the country of Jamaica, maybe I can be plus one when we get around to the next Olympics. Now, bear in mind, in February of 2018, I've probably skied 10 days, 14 days in my entire life. So this is just you know a pipe dream of a pipe dream. After the Olympics, I got to go and ski in Japan, Chile, Argentina, all in that year. Uh, and then at the start of 2019, uh, I went to an event that my friends had run called Send It. It's basically a tech entrepreneur conference that happens in Revelstoke. It's about 200 people uh, that get together, discuss business ideas, and, and have a lot of fun skiing and getting drunk on the mountain. At this event, I had the opportunity to ski with a former U.S. national skier called Gordon Gray. And I said to Gordon, I have this really crazy idea about trying to get to the Olympics for Jamaica. And it was just a crazy idea at that time. So Gordon and I ski together and he says, let me just see what you've got and I'll give you my honest opinion. At the end of the day, Gordon sits me down and says, okay, Benji, listen, I'm going to be brutally honest. Your technique absolutely sucks. He says, but that's to be expected. At this point, I'd skied 20, 25 days, right? He yeah. said, you've skied that number of days. You've only had a couple of lessons. Of course, your technique sucks. You don't learn technique by osmosis. You are taught technique and you haven't had any lessons. He says, but the one thing that I absolutely cannot understand, that I fail to understand, is how the hell you're keeping up with me. I've skied since I was two. I, was, I represented the United States. And here you are 20, 25 days into, into your ski career and you're keeping up with you. You're absolutely crazy. You're absolutely fearless. And actually having that lack of fear is probably more important than the technique. You can only go so far if you're afraid. But if you don't have that fear, then we can teach you the technique. And he was the guy that was really instrumental in helping me kind of break down which disciplines would be open for me, which ones would be more accessible in terms of ease of qualifying, uh, and just really helping me unravel the whole system and say, okay, go, point, point point yourself in this direction and just go for it. And on that trip, I spent a whole month in Revelstoke and some kind of crazy stats. I extended my month and ended up staying out there six, six weeks, just shy of. I skied 37 of those days. In those 37 days, I skied 1.7 million vertical feet, which for, an, you know, for a leisure skier, they might ski 10 or 15,000 feet in a day. Mm. And so the way that I like to look at that 1.7 million vertical feet is I packed 10 years of leisure skiing into you know, an intense 37 days. I left the mountain holding a record for the most amount of vertical feet skied in one day. I skied 103,351 feet. And just all of these crazy stats that I just found relatively easy to do, but everyone was just mind blown as to how are you doing this? Now, going back to what I said about the DJing and just doing something and learning something for learning's sake, and then all of a sudden you look in your rearview mirror and you seem to be better than, you know, 60% of people, 70% of people, and other people around you seem to be impressed by the thing that for you is just something that's happening because you've put time and effort into it. That's when I really was like, okay, let, let's do this. I found that Jamaica has a ski federation. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Mount Hood uh, and put on a pair of race skis for the first time and ski with a bunch of 14 year olds uh, and just get some race training. And, and, and now we're at this point where, as I just said, skied 180 something, 183 days in the last year and, and you know, pointing at this goal of being qualified within the next six, seven months. So let's talk about qualification, right? Yeah. So is there a different standard that Jamaica would have, or is it just anybody who shows up in the first, you know, if there's, there, we're going to take three guys in any one of these disciplines, and if there's four, then we'll have a ski off, and then if there's three, we'll take the three, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So this, this is the, like one of the most important things that everyone that's listening needs to understand with regards to how can it be possible that someone that's just started skiing in 2016, and especially someone that started skiing in later life, how is it, the possi how is it possible that he believes within five years he'll be able to qualify for the Olympics? Now, the spirit of the Olympics is that you have as many nationalities represented in as many disciplines as possible. And so what the, Olympics, uh, the Olympic Committee does to make that possible is every nation has the ability to put forward one B standard athlete. Now, that B standard athlete has to be of a professional level. They don't want embarrassments or they don't want people to injure themselves or to, you know, to kind of kill themselves on the, on the world stage. But what that basically means is, without getting into the complexity of like of the point system and the handicap, et cetera, et cetera, if I can get myself to the level of a really good 16-year-old ski racer 
you know, the, the cookie cutter ski racer started racing at the age of two, sorry, started skiing at the age of two, started racing at the age of seven. And by 16, they're going to be at that level if they're good that I need to get to for me to qualify for the, the for the Olympics. So for the anyone who's listening that may have taken part in any kind of ski racing, that would be 160 fist points that I need to get down to. And how do you accumulate these points? Being in races? Yeah, so going to races and your points are calculated by your proximity to the, the leaders and the lead pack and the handicap that the lead pack themselves have. So the, the more skilled the lead pack, the lower the points they have. And the closer you get to that group, the lower the points you are awarded for that. Okay, I got it. So the points, so is the racing season that you're going to try to accumulate these points then going to start uh, in 2021, January? Yeah, it starts in December, actually. First races are in uh, Jackson Hole and Snow King, uh, 17th of December, I believe. Great, great. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And so have you talked to anybody in the Jamaican government or the Jamaican Olympic Committee or how does that all work? Yeah. Uh, so most importantly, I have Dudley, Sno- Dudley Stokes on my team. He is the pilot or driver, whatever you want to call it, from the 1988 bobsleigh team, the, okay. the team that the movie was made about. Uh, so he's kind of like a mentor of mine. We speak every week. But with regards to uh, government help, I have the full backing, blessing, and support of the Jamaican Olympic Association and from the Minister for Sports and Culture. So, I mean, they're super keen to see Jamaica represented in more than just track and field. Uh, They're super keen to see Jamaica represented in different disciplines that, you know, we haven't been successful in before. And there's a lot of athletic talent here. And I, I, I feel that if some of that athletic athletic talent that's just kind of so hardcore focused on track and field and just the hundred meters and, and running would maybe consider other sports, I think Jamaica could do really well in winter in winter oh. sports. Yeah. So, wow, that's 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 interesting. So you're you're you know, when you talk about financial support or support, you didn't say financial. I'm saying I'm asking you this. Um, does that also mean financial support? Yeah. So not right now. And I also and, think, and, and, and let me let me back up just for for just yeah. one second. So so the reason why I'm asking you this is that anybody who's listening to this podcast and you've had this incredible life and you've gone all over in 30 plus countries and DJing and that of course you'd go and you DJ to get paid for it and that was part of the service yeah. that you were providing at the time. Totally get it. And then you know you retired from from that and now you're bouncing from you're currently on Jamaica and next week you go to Jackson Hole and you're in Revelstoke. Yeah. And you're, you're doing all this, you know, really cool stuff. And so I guess the question for people a lot of times when they're handicapped because they want to go after their why, they want to go after their dream, they want to go out to do chase some crazy thing, but they're financially like strapped to yeah. do what they want to do. And, and skiing is not an inexpensive sport. Absolutely. So you're absolutely right. And I think that's also a big part of the story that I'm trying to tell here. The story that I'm trying to tell here is not only that minorities can do well in, in winter sports, it's also that you can you can do really well even if you pick up something as le- as athletic as skiing at, at later on in your life. Um, but it's also trying to tell that skiing doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, think of how many pieces of sporting equipment, even the people that you're referring to um, that may be strapped and not being able to follow their dream, how many pieces of sporting equipment just sit idle in a garage that may have been used a couple of times and you, the person grew out of it or the person bought it and realized it wasn't really their thing. But, and so skiing is definitely one of those sports. If you are unafraid to just ask the people around you for help, for gear, you know, it's incredible how much, I mean, I looked at a photo um, of all of the things that I was wearing in July and every single piece of clothing that I was wearing was either a, a gift, a hand-me-down or something that I was sponsored. And so there are ways to make these, these things inexpensive. Same with traveling. You know, Tim Ferriss talks about this in the four hour, four hour work week. There are ways to travel and not have it be expensive. Most people, especially the people that are, particularly the people that are in cities, spend a lot of money on rent. If they stopped paying rent and moved out of their place and threw their stuff in storage, then, you know, you could come and live in Jamaica for three months. And for a lot of people, that would seem exotic. But actually, you'd, you'd probably spend less money than being in, in New York or Seattle or, or San Francisco, whatever you want. So it's really a mindset thing. And I've always had this ability to not follow what everyone thinks is, is, is the path or, you know, or, or kind of like just to kind of like choose my own path. And that goes all the way back to, 
you know, leaving Europe in 2006, three days after my last exam with no plan, but a one-way ticket to Asia with about 400 bucks in my bank account and no job, no accommodation, just, just having the ability to say, let's see if I can make this work. I ended up living in Asia for 10 years. But I think yeah, a lot of people really, really don't want to make moves until they're certain that their safety net is there. Mm. And then they're certain that the safety net is properly attached at all four corners. And if you spend all the time worrying about the backup, then you're not looking forward and you're not ever going to take any kind of risk. And those things don't happen, if, if that makes sense. What would be your fear, if any? Me, pers- me personally right now? Yeah. So right now, um, there are a couple of things at play that could throw this whole thing up in the air, Right. One of them that you alluded to with regards to how it's a weird world right now and we have to just act as if. One of them would be that I'd get all the way to 2022 and the Olympics don't happen. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we will have the Olympics and we can get into more detail in a moment. That would be one fear. Uh, another, another fear would be you know, a serious injury. As you said earlier about backcountry, it, it's snow joke. And there was a joke in yeah. there, it's snow yeah. joke. <laughs> no, but it's, it's really, in many situations, it can be life and death. Um, I, I've skied on hills where people were buried and killed in avalanches just a few days before, or I've fallen into tree wells, which, as you know, are incredibly dangerous, or just jumping out of helicopters. It, it's inherently a dangerous sport. So a fear would be to die, or a fear would be to seriously injure myself to a point where I miss so much of the ski season with a blown out knee or a broken leg that I'm unable to qualify, and then I'm a quote unquote failure. Um, another, fa- another fear would be financial. So it's a, it's a little known fact that the majority of Olympians come out of the Olympics closing ceremony somewhere between 30 to 50,000 US dollars in debt because to train to get to the Olympics requires such a level of you know, commitment that most people can't do it with a full-time job. So maybe they reduce themselves to a part-time job or maybe they just live off of savings for the you know, two or three years or longer that leads up to it. So the finance side of things is, is definitely a fear right now. And I'm definitely burning the candle at both ends when it comes to finance. I, I just got my, fi- uh, my first big sponsor a week ago, which is a company called Steel that I want to make a shout Hello, out Steel. to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Jackson Hall. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome guys. Uh, so I've just been filming some fun stuff. I was <laughs> filming me riding in, in full-on ski gear on a horse today and doing yoga by the beach yesterday in full-on ski gear. <laughs> um, so, yeah, those are the big fears. The Olympics don't happen. The I, I, serious injury or death. And if I die, you know, it is what it is. Um, and number three, finance. Those are my big fears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you got to go for it. And, and, and the thing that's crazy is that I'm a little bit older than you. And, you know, it's just amazing how you look back on life and you blink, blink. And, you know, many years ago, it seemed like yesterday I was playing in the NFL and I've had kids and I've done this yeah. and that. And that, like, now I'm right here, right, in this moment, in this time. And and, and yeah. in part, that's that's one of the reasons why a few years ago, you know, I, I moved my whole life to Sun Valley. You know, like you said, like, you can always, I guess, undo things. But I said, go for it, move to Sun Valley. It was climbing mountains around the world. You know, yeah. Sports Illustrated, you know, these other things. And, and, and I haven't looked back by really stepping out. Really what it was was stepping into the, into the fear. And by yeah. stepping into the fear has resulted these, these amazing gifts, you know, coming full circle back. And the beauty, too, about all this stuff, and these are just the, all the incremental benefits that you get, is, you know, you're down on the beach riding a horse in full snow gear or something, and you got your photographer, and you're in Jamaica, and now you're going to be in, in, um, in Jackson Hole next week, five hours away from Sun Valley, by the way. And, yeah. you know, the amazing people that come into your life, like if you hadn't stepped out into this to try something crazy, maybe you make it, maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you tried and that all these other forces around you could feel that positive energy that you have yeah. and came into your, into your planet, you know, your ecosystem around you. And, and, you know, you become a better person for that. Yeah, to- totally. I mean, sometimes failing is not a failure. Sometimes failing is a pivot into something that 10 years from, from now, you'd look back and realize that that was maybe the better thing that you didn't even think about because you were so focused on the first goal. And as you said, you, you know, I don't think there's anything more positive than a human that is on a mission that they're really, really pumped up and jazzed up about, like you going to climb Everest. You know, you talk about it with passion, with enthusiasm, and people are attracted to that. 
Yeah. And so just having a goal that you really care about, not going to the job you hate. You know, I've done that. I worked in tech. I worked yeah. in finance. And it's just the, you know, it's the badge that you wear that you work in one of these industries, but you hate it. And you're just kind of like a gray person, a miserable person. But when you're on the trajectory of chasing something that you really like, it could be a five minute mile, a six minute mile, a 10 minute mile, whatever. But when you, when you have this thing in your life that is a burning passion, it creates a better version of you. And I think, you know, I love the name of uh, the podcast, uh, Find Your Summit. Uh, you know, people should find their own individual summits, right? Yeah. And the thing that they want to chase after that makes them happy, that makes them want to wake up in the morning um, and just gives them that essence of being on a mission to achieve something. Yeah, I love that. I mean, look, I, I don't know the last day I ran in, I like, I, you know, like I'm talking to Benji Manji, I call you up and I go, mm -hmm. I had the most amazing day. I got up at seven o'clock in the morning. I rushed to my desk. I was pounding away at the computer all day long. I, you know, I made like 5,000 internet searches on this and that, yeah. put in all this data and there's a cell spreadsheet. Yeah. And then I, you know, went to the bathroom, you know, like who cares, right? <laughs> you will yeah. never yeah. see that. It's, it's all yeah. about those things that you're talking about is those life experiences outside of work. You have to work, and for so many of us, you have to monetize your life. You get a sense of accomplishment because you're finding the things that you really do want to do, but you know, yeah. you do got to step out there, and too many people get stuck in that world, and it's just my opinion, and I can tell it's your opinion too, not yeah. the way to live. Well, one, thing, one thing I do want to kind of reiterate is the only reason I'm where I am right now with skiing is because of the help of my friends, and I think a lot of people sometimes might be a little bit too proud to ask for help from people around them. And I find that quite often in life, there are so many of these kind of arbitrations where something might mean a lot to you, like a thousand dollar pair of skis, as I said, to use that same example, but might be a piece of equipment that's never gonna get used again, that's sitting in someone's garage. Just by kind of re removing your pride and being like, hey bud, can I, can I use those? Can I borrow them? Maybe can I even just buy them off you for a cheap, has just saved you a thousand bucks. When you start looking for those little arbs or when you start looking for those opportunities to reduce the costs of doing the thing that you love or the thing that you're chasing, then it makes it ever easier. You don't have to be in an office 40 hours a day to afford this, you know, this luxury pursuit, as it were. And you know, we're much greater when we're a part of a group of, of good people and they can obviously help you with the lessons that they've learned along the way. And I'm sure you're doing the same thing, speaking to a lot of kind of mountaineers and people that have probably climbed or Everest before and they're just kind of teaching you the pitfalls pun intended to avoid on your way there oh yeah oh yeah there, there's nothing that can also not just knowledge is power but also just the experience of doing that thing let me ask you this where can people find you we want to follow this um thing. yeah the, the the current place best place i would say is instagram or facebook instagram is benji b-e-n-j-i dot ski and if you go to www.benji.ski, you can also find me there for the people that don't use Instagram. Love it, love it. Love your enthusiasm, love your passion, love your journey, love where you've been, love where you're going. Yeah. So listen, man, thank you so much for coming on the pod. It's been great beaming all the way from chilly Sun Valley all the way to sunny Jamaica, man. So thank yeah, you so man. much. <laughs> yeah, man. Bless up, they would say. <laughs> all right. All right. There he is. The one, the only, Benji Alexander. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because as you know everybody has their own summit that they're going after okay if you're looking to follow my journey you can find that through my social links on mark pattison nfl.com that's mark m-a-r-k -M pattison p-a-t-t-i-s-o-n nfl.com so until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.